Welcome to the Abyssinian syllabary, where we spell out Ethiopia in 33 characters. I'm Yves Marie Stranger, your host and the compiler of these Abyssinian lives. Nota bene. While any resemblance to actual countries, past or present, and to historical figures is not purely coincidental, this is a work of fiction. For a primer on these Ethiopian characters, newcomers may start with the prologue by Manuel de Goes. To order the book or a poster of the Abyssinian syllabary, visit uthiopia.com. That's U-T-H-I-O-P-I-A dot com. As he was reading the future for a country squire in Begumder, the fates that Jacob discerned in the grounds held little to please his lordship. No matter, the master exclaimed, faintly. I have a weakness for coffee. Let us sip another cup, and I shall surely find you a better future this time round. The Apocrypha of Zere Jacob Sh, Arab Feki Arab Feki, may the Prophet bless his pen, who later on was to become a visionary capable of obscuring a canvas with many embellishments, was born short-sighted in al Yaman's Tihama in Zabid, a city replete with studious scholars and indolent donkeys. The Tihama, long laid waste by Aksumite picaroons, is populated by wretches who style themselves Arabs, yet it is clear to all that their murky skin, which they blame on the glut of seafare in their diet, will forever be a question mark bookmarking their fishy tails. Far inland lie the pigs that the Romans knew as Arabia Felix. This is where dwell the Semitic folks with their blue-green eyes. A superb memorialist, which means that he was capable of attention to detail as well as availing himself of a rife imagination, Arab Faki became a fierce pamphleteer if somewhat inclined to a Muslim reading of events, but so much is to be expected, especially in times of war. It is perchance because he was myopic that Arab Faki surmised that he descended himself from a Meccan sheriff, while his own skin, which was blackish, seemed to point to a descendant from the African Habesh. Many of these Habistanis put down roots in the country at the time of the conquest of Himyar, in the year the Prophet, may peace be upon his name, was born, a year the Holy Quran trumpets as the year of the elephant. No matter, as the color of the scribe's skin is less important than the color of the ink, very black too, and masterfully crushed, that Arab Feki poured onto parchment. With his sootish concoctions, Faki painted the flows of red blood with which the Emir Ahmad ibn Ibrahim al-Ghazi the Conqueror, whom the infidels dismiss as Grany or the left-handed, was to fertilize Habistan. Faki immortalized all this in his conquest of Abyssinia, a blow-by-blow -blow account of Emir Ahmad's campaign. It was the hot season in the Tihama, which is to say that the gates of hell were blasting much like a furnace when the child Faki began to stumble into door jams. An Israelite was sent for, and this physician drummed his fingers over the child's bones. Arab Faki was at the time a four-year-old, without much meat and certainly no fat at all. This Jew declared Faki to be in rude health, only purblind and, to put paid to the parents' lamentations, he purchased for Faki a pair of horn-rimmed spectacles. In those years, the Turks had made of the Red Sea a Muslim lake. Trade thrived between Egypt and Lebanon and the African shores as far as Zanzibar and Sofala, and with the kingdoms of Gujarat from across the Mother of Waters. Al-Yemen, a disheveled and ill-kept province, as the Ottoman Pasha had placidly declared it upon his arrival, lay at the nexus of these trading routes. Incense and gum from Arabia, Nubians and ivory from Africa, spices and peppers 
from the kingdoms of Hindustan. Then the Nasranis had horned in from the Frank kingdom of Portugal, a dominion of Al-Andalus, not that long ago. The Franks had ransacked Zela, a settlement without a single cannon piece, bombarding the port for their jollification. The Ottoman Pasha, an Armenian convert to the true faith, it was said, preferred his taxes to be timely. His only option had been to send a troop of blunderbuss totting janissaries to counter the misdeeds of the infidels and ensure that the perfidious Abyssinians would not stage another attack on Mecca. Those bandy-legged Abyssinians on which the Hadith pours such scorn. The Franks, not to be outdone, disembarked another 400 musketeers in Habistan. Arab Faki, assisted by his spectacles, had learnt to write and to read, a calling he loved above all else. He read from morning to night with a whetted appetite, in Arabic, in Persian. He devoured the Thousand and One Nights, in particular Simbad the Sailor, and any tales set in the Baghdad of Harun al-Rashid. Faki also adored Homer's Ulysses and the life of Alexander as he could interpret the books of the Habesh, written in a vitiated form of Yemeni. For all these accomplishments, and for his knowledge, Faki was mandated with the squad sent to bolster the emir of Harar in his holy war against the Habesh king. The Yemeni called this Habesh monarch Najashi the apostate, as a reminder of the conversion of his ancestor, Najashi the righteous. That Najashi had been led into the true faith by Uthman, the son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon his name, during the first Hijira, when the early Muslims had sought asylum from the Quraysh in Abyssinia, which was in those times a godly country. When Arab Faki clambered atop the plateau of Abistan, he believed, similarly to his Ottomani and Yemeni fellows, to have arrived in the Garden of Paradise. Forest crowned every summit, while bracing waterfalls sprung from each cliff. A thousand springs, rivers and lakes irrigated this blessed realm. In these uplands, the verdant color of Islam prevailed, so that the dark green of the banners of the soldiers of Al-Yaman blended into the rich pastures. For the writer of weak eyesight, the battles were set against the backdrop of these viridescent drapes. In the penumbra of his tent, which he liked poorly lit with one sole candle, Faki scrawled in his florid hand glorious accounts that extolled the metal of his gallant companions. In Faki's tale, modelled on the exploits of Alexander, fortresses fell with nearer fight, with the recusants gaily returning to the faith in mass ceremonies. Dressed in their whitest gabby cloth, the jubilant crowds returned to the conviction held by their forefathers. In Arab Faki's fancy, these scenes unfolded on a sea of grass in which bevies of snow-white ibis came to rest. The cries of ecstasy that rose from all sides brought to Faki's mind the scenes he had committed to memory from the books read in his juvenescence. His short-sightedness spared Arab Faki the view of the slit throats and of the obdurate prodded to cliff edge at the point of a sword like so many sheep. His companions in arms sought out his darkened tent, where they found solace from their holy war, as Arab Faki's deft pen bore witness to their blessed acts. His death was a huge loss to them and to history itself, a history which, due to the perishing of Arab Faki, found itself rewritten by others, just as blindsided as himself, albeit from a different angle. Desirous of being close to a naval battle on Lake Tanna, Arab Faki found his way down to the lake shore, which was treacherous. The pamphleteer flailed about in the reed beds, then proceeded to drown. These lakeside papyri are such as a green curtain for this final scene, the scribe had time to think as still he was composing in his mind's eye. It is paradise announcing itself, thought Arab Faki at the very last, before being engulfed by the green waters.